Next section is going to be about weather. So what is the best time to visit Japan? Okay. Uh, for me, I would say spring or fall. I went last September, which was kind of the end of summer, and there was a heat wave around that time. So even though I went after the summer period was over, it was hot. It was like in the 90s on some days, uh, and it's very humid over there, so you're sweating. But otherwise, I would say normally it should be mild. You just want to avoid the peak of summer and winter because it, it does get cold enough to snow over there. So if you're not used to that, if you don't want to deal with that, then you don't really want to go during the winter months where it's really cold. And then the summer, the like June, July, August, very, very hot. And I would avoid those, those times myself. What should I pack for different seasons? I would always recommend to pack your outfits in layers. Just so you can layer and de-layer as you need as it gets hot, as it gets cold. Plus, you can mix and match a lot more outfits with the same amount of items if you layer a lot. Otherwise, though, I would highly recommend that you shop when you're there. I ended up spending a lot of time <laughs> and quite a bit of money at Uniqlo. I do like Uniqlo. And over in Japan, it's not only is it cheaper, but also the exchange rate was better. So it was even more cheaper. In some cases, duty-free, so no tax. I didn't have to pay tax, so it was even cheaper, again. And the clothing sizing matches my body build better because over there, they size the clothing for Asians, and I'm Asian size, so <laughs> the clothes just fit me better over there. It's, it's, it's actually great, and I miss it a lot. So if any of those things ring a bell for you, wait till you go over there and just go nuts and just, just buy a whole new wardrobe when you're there buy a whole nother luggage and fill it up with all the cool stuff that you're going to buy over there. <laughs> so that's what I would recommend. There are all kinds of shops over there available from the basic like Uniqlo all the way to the designer labels and everything like that. How is the weather in insert specific month in Japan? Okay, so you know, the answer is I don't know. I've only been to Japan one time. I think in general, you know, like I said earlier, just avoid the peak of summer and the peak of winter. Otherwise, Google's your friend. I would Google weather trends or, or just keep an eye out. But even during my trip with all the research, I couldn't avoid a little bit of rain. You know, I just dealt with it. I packed an umbrella just in case. Even a rainy day exploring Tokyo is better than a lot of days, you know, back home. <laughs> Our next section is going to be tourist attractions. So uh, which cities or regions should I visit in Japan? Okay, if, you're, if this is your first visit, I recommend that you visit the big three. Tokyo, Osaka, and Kyoto. Even though I spent two weeks in Japan, I felt like that was not enough time to get a really good sense of all three cities. If I was going to do it again, you know, I'd probably just add more time. I would just probably add like th a third week and keep the same three city itinerary. I did those three big cities over two weeks and I didn't have enough time to do everything that I wanted to do. But it was still super fun. If you have one week or less in Japan, then unless you know specifically what you're going there for, like if you want to go to one of those hot spring hotels, for example, specifically in some region, I would just go to Tokyo. So if you've never been to Japan, you don't really know what you want to do, go to Tokyo. Experience the big city. There's so much to do over there that even within a week, I feel it is not enough. There's going to be a lot of restaurants that you wish that you could have tried. There's going to be a lot of things at the Kombini you wish you would have ate. There's going to be a lot of attractions that you wish you could have seen. So one week or less, definitely Tokyo, unless you know exactly that you want to go to Osaka, or Kyoto, or Hokkaido, or somewhere else for some very specific reason. Go to Tokyo. What are the must-see attractions in Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka? Okay, so, you know, this depends on what you like. For me personally, I'm a big theme park person, so I did visit Tokyo Disneyland and Disney Sea and Universal Studios Osaka. I kind of wanted to go to the Hello Kitty and Friends one, but I didn't have time, and it wasn't really high on my priority list. But definitely theme parks, especially if you like that kind of stuff. Some of my best experiences that I've ever had at theme park were these theme parks in Japan. Other than that, I would definitely recommend Team Labs. So I went to Team Lab Planets. And very recently, I saw that Team Lab Borderless just reopened in, and I think, Shinjuku as well. And I definitely would have gotten a Borderless if I could have. I heard so many good things about it, but it just wasn't open when I went. So I'm going to have to put it on my next trip. But I would highly, highly recommend either of those team lab experiences. I thought it was going to be all hype because I've seen influencers post about it on socials and sometimes it's hard to believe that it's really that good. Is it just a good photo or is it like a really cool experience? I actually thanked my friend that convinced me to go because it really was a unique experience. Just speaking on planets by itself, not only like do you walk through water, which I think everyone knows and, and they have that famous like room with all these lights, hundreds and hundreds of them. 
they advertise themselves as a full sensory art exhibit and I think that they nailed it because they even thought it down to there was a specific section that I still remember very vividly where you're just walking between one exhibit and another exhibit and it's kind of dark but they went into such detail to even change the texture of the flooring in this area so that your feet had this different sensory experience. It just felt different under your feet. And it was nice. It wasn't like a weird feeling. It was a nice feeling. And it's just something that I remember is like, wow, they even went to that length to add something in a dark hallway for you to feel an experience. So highly, highly recommend a Team Lab exhibit. Next, I'm a little bit of a geek when it comes to some things. Like I do watch some anime. I do play video games. I did look for that when I was there. Since I enjoy games and things like that so much, one of the first things I would recommend is a round one, especially if you don't have a round one near you in the US. If you've never heard of round one and you like video games and you like arcades and you don't have one near you, then try to go to round one. I think you'll think it's really cool. Like they have those kind of like DDR like dance machines, uh, the newer ones, and a lot of like these Japanese arcade games that we don't get here in the US. I would also recommend to go to Akihabara that area is a dub electric town, but that was, to me, it really spoke to me on my like gamer geek level. There are just arcades everywhere with um, not only like video game machines, but gachapon and those claw game machines. It's just like a, a gaming entertainment kind of heaven. That's also where you're gonna find like retro game stores if you're looking for like just old systems like Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Genesis, uh, anyways, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, retro games, that, that's where you're gonna find it. Although it's priced very high, it's priced for tourists. They know that tourists are coming from overseas to look for this stuff in particular. So you're gonna be looking at like $250 for like a Game Boy Advance SP. For example, if you go to the, the famous places like uh, Super Potato in Akihabara, that one was priced very expensive. I mean, I wanted to go because I've seen it in so many videos, but the train of being able to get cheap retro stuff over there is kind of past or it's passing right now. So I would recommend to check it out. And if it's within your budget and you don't mind paying that much for that kind of stuff, yeah, go, go for it. Go crazy. Um, they're going to have a lot of stuff available other attractions. I did enjoy going to Shibuya Sky, which is a rooftop experience in Shibuya. It's actually right at the, one of the corners of Shibuya Crossing. We ended up getting there a little bit late, so the sun had already set when we were there, and we didn't book early enough in advance. So that's kind of why we had like a late time slot and things like that. But amazing view up on the rooftop. You can see all four sides of the building. So 360 degrees, you, you can see the skyline of Tokyo. Pretty amazing. If you can, book as early as possible and try to get a, a slot right before sunset, maybe like an hour before sunset. Once you're in, you can stay as long as you want. That's what I recommend for that. Other than that, very similarly, when we were in Osaka, we did go to Umeda Sky Building. So kind of a similar experience. However, I actually ended up liking Umeda Sky as well in its own way. Umeda Sky is not as tall as the one in Shibuya. But there's actually two levels. One level is going to be a cafe. And so it was a little bit raining when we went. So it was nice to have this like indoor level where you can buy a coffee or a drink or a snack and then go over to these windows and they have like bar seating right at, at this long row of windows. And you can just sit there, enjoy your coffee, tea and look out at the skyline. And it's beautiful. It was memorable for me and I would highly recommend you made a sky building in Osaka. There's so many attractions. I think if I talked about all the attractions, we'd be here for like an hour. So I'm just going to go for the next question. Are there any off the beaten path destinations worth exploring? Yes, 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 yes. Very much so. Go explore random restaurants and shops. You never know what you're going to find. And you might find some nice gems, actually. I'll give you a couple examples. So one of my best meals that I had in Japan was curry. And uh, it was a restaurant that I didn't research. I was just hungry on my first full day there. And I was at the Parco building where the Nintendo store is and things like that and the Pokemon store. And I was hungry and there is kind of like a whole floor of restaurants on the, in the basement floor. So all the way on the bottom, there's a lot of little restaurants. And I was in the mood for curry and I found this curry restaurant and I will put it up here on the screen. I can't remember the name, but I'll, I'll put it up on the screen for you. It was literally one of the best meals that I had all trip. 
it, it wasn't even like traditional Japanese curry. It was kind of like a fusion curry. So I, I had a butter chicken. So it was butter chicken, but with a Japanese twist to it. And just the quality of everything was good. It wasn't like Japanese rice, it was saffron rice. And this butter chicken was absolutely delicious. And I still think about that meal to this day. And it was just like a random restaurant. I, I feel like there in Japan, you can take a rock, you can throw it off of the roof of any building, and it, you know, whatever it lands on, go try it. And it's probably going to be good. I didn't really go to too many tourist spots or the famous spots because I'm not the type to wait an hour for, you know, quote unquote Michelin style ramen. I don't care about that kind of stuff. And I think that's a good call in Japan, especially because not only is there going to be that you know michelin rated ramen right there but down the block there's probably going to be two three four five other restaurants serving something kind of similar or close to that and it's going to be just as good they just haven't been found by social yet and so they're not as well known but yes be adventurous there especially with food <laughs> almost all the food there i thought was good and that goes for shopping as well. Some of the coolest souvenirs and knickknacks I found were just like little tiny mom and pop shops or shops that I didn't recognize when I was there. So if you see something interesting in the window, you know, pop in. It's probably going to be really cool. Next section is going to be safety and health. So is Japan a safe country for tourists? I would say yes. Um, you can leave your belongings at a restaurant table while you use the restroom and it will be there when you get back. It's kind of strange, a little bit of a culture shock, especially for me coming from the US where no one would dare leave their personal belongings on a restaurant table and then leave for a short amount of time. Nobody would dare because that's just asking for it to be taken. But in Japan, you can do that. Actually, that is the custom over there for counter service food. You don't get your food first and then go look for a table like in the US. You actually go and find your table first and you put something there. Sometimes I see like, hand towels. Hand towels are a thing there in Japan where uh, it's just like a little towel to dry your hands and people will leave that on the table or I'll just see stuff, you know, people will, like leave their backpack or something like that at Starbucks at the seat. So you go find your seat first, you put whatever you want there to let people know that that seat is now taken and then you go order. You grab your food and you come back and your stuff will be there when you get back 99% of the time. I probably wouldn't do it at a very highly trafficked tourist area because then your stuff might just get taken by another tourist. But when I was in local spots, I felt very comfortable doing that. Same thing with walking around at night. I mean, with any country, there's going to be kind of the seedier areas. But even when I was walking around at night in Shinjuku, any kind of major area, I felt very safe. But that is my point of view as a male. It might be different as a female. I have heard some stories from some of my female friends where a creepy guy will be following them for some time or some distance. And, and that does happen over there. So I would definitely recommend caution. But Japan is probably the safest country that I visited so far. And I've been to Europe, Asia. I would say the, the other place that I felt very safe was Thailand. I felt that Thailand was a very, very, very safe country to visit. Uh, but Japan, in terms of safety, even tops it for me. So very safe. Do I need travel insurance for my trip to Japan? I think this is up to you. I personally did buy travel insurance just in case. And I do this as a habit because I just want to be prepared. It only cost me about $30 to cover myself for a one month period. And that's on the more expensive side, I think. I went with Amex insurance. It was recommended on Reddit. And I do have an Amex card, which you, you don't need if you want to buy Amex travel insurance. But yeah, I just went with that. It was $30 for one month. To me, that's not expensive. You can find travel insurance for $15 for the same amount of period for the same situation. I did shop around a little bit. I just went with, you know, the brand name or whatever. So my answer is, it's up to you. I personally do get travel insurance because you never know. I don't want to be stuck in a foreign country, really sick or really injured, and then owe a lot of money. <laughs> I, I just I just don't. I think this is like the shitty US health care system and insurance system that we have over here that is influencing my thought. But for 30 bucks, peace of mind, I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to worry about it. I thought it was worth it. Next question, what should I do in case of an emergency? My number one tip here is just to remember that their emergency number is not 911, it's 119. That's my top tip. Remember that it's 119 in case you have an emergency. I didn't use it, so I don't have experience on, on how it actually is, but I did read that they do have English speaking staff on hand. And so if you do need to make a, a call for any reason and you only speak English, then they should be able to find someone on their staff to communicate with you. All right, next section is gonna be technology and connectivity. 
Can I use my mobile phone in Japan? So the answer is yes. You can do it in a couple of different ways. You can either add an international package to your US carrier plan. This is the more expensive way to go, but it's easier and you can keep your US phone number in case you need to receive calls or make calls from your US phone number while you're there. For this, you just check with your carrier to see what their rates are, who their roaming partner is, and what type of data they offer. If it's LTE or 5G, you can find out all about that stuff through talking to your carrier. You can call up customer service or go visit a retail store. They should be able to answer your questions there. Or the other option, which I personally use and I recommend, is to get a local SIM card to the country you're traveling to, in this case, Japan, a Japan SIM card or eSIM to use data while you're there. So I'm not the type to make a lot of phone calls. I don't need my US number. I don't, I don't care about receiving phone calls when I'm over there. So a local eSIM is the preferred way to go. If your phone is, I think, iPhone 10 and higher, I'm not really sure on the Android side, but let's say if you have a phone within the last like five years, something like that, it should be eSIM compatible. Just Google your phone model number and type in eSIM to see if it is. But if it's eSIM compatible, it's so easy to get a foreign SIM card and put it in your phone. You don't need anything physical. I did it while I was at the airport waiting for my flight the night of the flight and I did it about an hour before I was going to take off. You do need some internet to finish the process so I recommend to do it a little bit before you leave or, or just make sure that you have some type of internet access when you land like the airport Wi-Fi or something like that. But it's so easy. It took about 30 minutes total because I had to create an account and then I had to wait for that account to activate or something and then I can add this, the SIM card in. But it was relatively painless. It took me about 30 minutes. I did it the night of my flight and it worked flawlessly when I got there. I highly relied on my mobile phone when I was there. I was going through my battery so much because I was always on Google Maps or looking for highly rated restaurants or tourist attractions or dessert places that I wanted to visit. And so I was on my phone a lot. So. If I have a tip here, get a Japanese compatible eSIM card. I would recommend Yubiki, U-B-I-G-I. -I. I'm definitely not sponsored, but um, when I was researching, I found that most Reddit users recommended this one. And it's highly recommended because their partner carrier in Japan offers 5G. So otherwise, if you go with another random provider, it might be LTE only, which will give you slower data speeds. And I, I like to have fast data. So I went with Yubigi and they worked really well. Their rates are a little bit more expensive than some other sims, but pretty reasonable. And also I recommend to bring a battery pack with a charging cable or hopefully it has wireless charging option because I was burning through my battery so much and my phone was newer. It's like an iPhone 14 and I was still going through my battery a lot. Next question, is there free Wi-Fi available in public spaces? So the answer is sometimes yes, but it's not everywhere. And I'm not the type of person to rely on random Wi-Fi spots. Well, one is convenience because I just like to have data when I need it and I don't want to rely on having to physically be in a specific place to do anything with my data. And then also security wise, uh, I don't I don't like uh, logging into random Wi-Fi spots. Like people can set up Wi-Fi spots anywhere and uh, have malicious intentions. You know, it's not secure for your data to be logging into unknown or unfamiliar Wi-Fi spots when you're out and about. Because of those two reasons, I just would go with a local SIM card with data. I mean, it's only like 20 to $50 probably, maybe even less if you don't need use that much data. You're gonna have your own data connection and it's gonna be there when you need it and you're not logging into like some random Wi-Fi spot. Next, where can I buy a SIM card or rent a pocket Wi-Fi device? Okay, so you can do this when you're at the airport over there. There are places that you can buy a physical SIM card. Like let's say if your phone does not support eSIM and you need a physical SIM card, you can buy one there. You can also buy one and have it shipped to you online. But if you have a phone compatible with eSIM, I recommend go with eSIM. That's pretty much all the questions. I hope that was useful for everyone. If you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the comments and maybe I'll make another video. All right, safe travels, everyone. Bye.